Welcome to the Situation Report today. Glad to have you joining me. My name is Jeremy Stolliker. I am your host. And this is the show, of course, if you've listened before, you know that this is the show where you receive the information and perspectives you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. Uh, we do our very best to bring on the best guests, people who can deconstruct what is happening, and then on the other side of that, give us some steps to move forward. Today's guest is one who does that so well. We've had him on before, and I'm grateful to have him again with us today. Uh, the world is crazy. Our country's crazy. Our politics, uh, hard to understand. We've been talking to folks from Florida over the last couple of weeks, and I'm grateful to get kind of the other end of the spectrum perspective from someone who is articulate, clear, and understands what is happening, not only in his own state of New York, but across the country. Very grateful to bring back on, once again, Gavin Wax. My guest today is Gavin Wax. Gavin's been with us before and uh, grateful to have him back. He is the 76th president of the New York Young Republicans Club, chairman of the New York Republican Liberty Caucus, Newsmax, no, Newsmax contributor, it's not easy to say, and digital director for Getter. Gavin, thank you so much for coming back on, man. Really appreciate it. It's great to be back. Thank you guys for having me back. Uh, we uh, had to fight through some technical issues, so this is going to be a very important issue. Uh, um, episode. I know that because every time it's hard, it always turns out great. So I'm excited, <laughs> excited about it. Um, let's, uh, let's start. There are a lot of things I'd love to talk about, but let's start first of all with New York politics. There's so much happening in New York. And I think uh, a lot of the country just has kind of put New York on a shelf, right? Like they're doing their thing and it doesn't matter. Um, but it, it really does right now. Give us the 30,000 foot view, if you wouldn't mind. And let's start there. What's happening in New York politically? particularly as we look toward the, the midterms. Absolutely. Well, in addition to the regular congressional midterms, we obviously have a, uh, a gubernatorial race that's ongoing. A lot of the statewide elected offices, attorney general, comptroller, et cetera, are all on the ballot this November. Uh, most of the analysts and commentators in New York and nationally are saying that, you know, despite this being a very blue state, despite this being a very Democrat state, that uh, this is the best opportunity we've had uh, in basically a few decades uh, since Pataki uh, for a Republican to be back in the uh, the governor's mansion. And we are uh, seeing a lot of trends that are happening at the local state and federal level that are uh, giving us some positive signs uh, for what could potentially be a good year here in New York. Obviously, it's still going to be an uphill fight. Uh, there's the odds are still stacked against us. Yeah. And more likely than not, it's still going to be a Democrat year in New York. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good shot. And there's a lot of yeah. uh, fundamentals to hope for. So we have Congressman Lee Zeldin running for governor right now. And uh, he's running against uh, Kathy Hochul, Hochul Pokel, uh, who was unelected, <laughs> uh, the replacement for the disgraced former yeah. governor, Andrew Cuomo. And uh, look, it, th things are things are getting so bad in New York that they could be good for us politically. It's, it's cyclical in that nature. Uh, so that's what we're really facing. A lot with the midterms and a lot of congressional seats up for grabs. Uh, Governor Hochul is, is really interesting to me because she kind of illustrates to me what I feel like is a Democrat, the Democratic Party not understanding what the rest of the country is dealing with. Instead of just filling a seat and just filling out her term and then running for office, she's taken some really radical steps, particularly related to uh, the Second Amendment and a lot of other things. Um, is that an overreach? Is that intentional? Will that work? Are New Yorkers rejecting that? Are they accepting it? What's the tone around her? I mean, I think at the end of the day, a lot of people don't respect her, even in her own party. She's not as feared as Cuomo was. Uh, she's basically kind of the filler candidate, and they're running her because she doesn't have necessarily any baggage. Yeah. Uh, and she'll just continue with the party's uh, leftward trend. I mean, this is a woman who has no principles. She originally, uh, coming from the Buffalo area, was uh, previously endorsed by the NRA in local races she ran for. She ran on the conservative party line. So she's come a long way from being sort of a blue dog Democrat to now being the standard bearer. Uh, of New York left-wing extremism, you know, pushing uh, some of the most egregious gun laws, some of the most re egregious right. COVID restrictions, you know, some of the things she's she's come out and publicly stated, you know, talking to people to get vaccinated, like they're her apostles, right. like almost right. like cult-like. So she's all over the place. I think she's a very weak candidate. Um, but again, it's still an uphill fight. And uh, are people rejecting her? I think they are rejecting her. She suffered a lot of losses uh, in the courts. She lost with her attempts to gerrymander the 
maps here in New York State. Yep. Uh, she has lost already at the Supreme Court uh, with the gun law, and then it's also been challenged again. Uh, her new bills that she's pushed forward. So she's losing a lot of legal battles. She's losing support. She's definitely weak. Uh, and they're kind of on the back foot. So maybe her hubris will get the better of her. We'll have to see yeah. come November. There's an entire new economy being created right now filled with patriotic companies that have had enough of cancel culture and the left. One, you can support every day and all you have to do is get dressed. I'm talking about under tack boxers. These have to be the greatest boxers ever made, probably because they have literally been tested by special forces operators. They're made with high quality material that's antimicrobial, anti-pilling, and moisture wicking, so you stay fresh and dry all day long. They come with a sturdy yet comfortable waistband that doesn't crack or loosen. Undertack is durable, ultralight, and shrink resistant. Here's the best part, they're almost 30% less than the woke designer brands with the non-binary models. Go to getundertack.com, that's getundertack.com. Right now, when you buy three, get one free, but only with the offer code SITREP20, SITREP20. Support a great American company that's pro-America, pro-Second Amendment, and pro-military. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back getundertack.com that's getundertack.com offer code sitrep20 i've been uh, talking to a lot of folks in florida and that's been an interesting conversation because i am a proponent i live in california so i am a proponent of working from the bottom up i mean we need to start you know <laughs> the homeowners association the school board city councils and we can change a state i believe by working from the bottom up but it seems like in a state like Florida, the change at the bottom has happened because of what happened at the top. Governor DeSantis has just changed the conversation. And then you see school boards changing. You see city councils changing. You see all these things happening. When you look at a state like New York, do you believe that that bottom up approach is one that can work? Or is the fight really at the top? Is the fight to change the governor and then see changes happen downstream? How do you view that? That's a really good question. You make a good analogy with DeSantis sort of turning Florida from a purple state right. to like one of the one, like a red Republican bastion that it's right. Becoming. So <laughs> right. It's an interesting it's an interesting argument. I mean, here in New York, I mean, I think at the ground level, things have really been deteriorated. The Republican Party is extremely weak at the state and local level. Uh, the grassroots is weak. A lot of our uh, typical Republican voters are either dying or are moving. Mm. Uh, so we're losing a lot of the battles on the ground. I think there's marginal uh, gains that are being made. There's marginal movement in the right direction in a place like New York City, etc. But I do think uh, what could kind of bring New York back is if we kind of had a top Top of, yeah. the, top of the pyramid win. I think that would give a morale boost that we desperately need. I think you also have to remember that the governor of New York is one of the most powerful governor positions uh, in the 50 states. Uh, it has a lot of power. It's almost like a dictatorship yeah. in many ways. Cuomo wielded it that way. So if you put the right person in that office, a Republican who's committed uh, to using power effectively, which as Ron DeSantis has shown can be done, uh, then you could see a lot of wins and it could begin to trickle down. But I think it really depends on the state. I think, I think some states you need that kind Kind of top-down approach some states you need that bottom-up approach it's, it's really a balance you have a lot of red states where the fundamentals on the ground are strong you have a strong mm. grassroots you have a strong base you have a lot of republican electeds but then you get to the top of it and they elect weak governors they elect weak members yeah. of congress they elect a lot of weak republican officials so and that happens in deep red states and then you see a place like florida which is still technically you know almost purple in many yeah. regards especially yeah. its composition in the legislature and you get a guy like ron DeSantis who's governing like it's a r plus you know 50 states so it, it's a balance. I think it's a state by state basis. I think New York would benefit uh, from a, ch a change up top and let it trickle down. What could the Republican Party in New York do that they're not doing? You say they're very weak and they've, they've lost ground. What could they be doing that they're not doing that they should be doing if they want to win? I mean, it's a, it's the same story that happens across the country. I think you have a lot of uh, rhinos, that you have a lot of grifters, that you have a lot of consultant hacks uh, who are basically sucking uh, the resources of the party dry, that are misleading the base, misleading the grassroots, uh, cutting deals with the Democrats. I mean, we've seen a lot of this happen here in New York. Uh, most recently, you know, I had a lawsuit here in New York to challenge the, uh, the gerrymandered assembly maps, and we were going up against some Republicans who were in leadership, oh, Republicans' yeah. leadership in the assembly because they cut a dirty deal with the Democrats. So you got a really clean house. I think that's part of a broader national 
a national issue where we're cleaning house in the Republican Party, cleaning the ranks, and getting people who are ideologically committed, who have the real principles, and have an agenda other than just self-aggrandizement. I think those are the types of people we need in leadership positions uh, here in New York. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the party has been weak. We had a chairman who was running for Congress in the midst of uh, all of this. You know, he's, he's still collecting a paycheck from the state party, but he's running for office. So it, it hasn't exactly been a great situation here in right. New York because of that. Um, but, you know, there's still a lot of room to be hopeful. There are trends that are working our way. I think we're making inroads with Hispanics. I think we're making inroads with Asians. I think we're turning a lot of these former white ethnic, Catholic, uh, blue collar union voters who are still voting for Cuomo. I think they're going to come back home to the Republican Party and start voting uh, Republican down ballot. So there's a lot of things to be hopeful for. I know I've seen some internal numbers for the state Senate. You know, it wasn't that long ago, 2018, that we controlled the legislative chamber mm. in New York. We had a tenuous control over the state Senate. We can flip that back and we can bring a bit of two party uh, sensibility back into our state government because right now it's one party madness and they're running the state into the ground. How have advances been made with some of the ethnic minorities that you mentioned? I, I look at a place like Texas. I've got a lot of friends in Texas. And uh, in fact, the headquarters for our the organization that I work for is in Texas. Um, but there's a lot of fear, particularly among politicians in Texas, that the state could go uh, blue. If, if not entirely, then it's drifting that way for sure. And Hispanic vote seems to be a big deal, a big conversation here in California. Same thing. How are those inroads being made in New York that could serve maybe as a model in, in other places? Yeah, I mean, I would actually say that Texas is more of a model. You see, at the, you look at the Rio Grande Valley, you know, some of the most Hispanic right. counties in the country, they've shifted the furthest right. You know, they, they are realigning these conservative uh, Tejanos who have been in the country, you know, since its founding for right. hundreds of years. Right. Uh, they're, they're voting, you know, in line with Republican voters. And it's been that Tejano shift to the right, along with actually, surprisingly, a lot of the inbound migration into Texas. They did studies. That said, yes, are there are there San Francisco liberals moving to Austin? Absolutely. But there are also a lot of Republicans and conservatives from California, from New York, from other blue states that are moving to Texas and are shoring up the numbers. So uh, I think the blue Texas has been talked about a lot. I think for the time being, at least for the next two to three, maybe four cycles, I think Texas should be fine. Um, but, you know, we definitely have to keep our guard up. Yeah. I think the biggest problem for a place like Texas is that uh, a lot of the a lot of voters are really being indoctrinated through colleges. You have these mm. people that are growing up in Republican households in Texas. They're their mother, their father. They're conservative. They go to college. They come out. They're a liberal. I think that's a much bigger threat along with illegal immigration. So, but to pin it to New, to shift it to New York, you look at what happened in New York with the uh, 2020 race. Uh, you looked at what happened most recent mayoral race. A lot of the biggest shifts as a percentage uh, to the right have been among working class Hispanic communities in the outer boroughs, in a lot of these ethnic encl enclaves. You're seeing shifts among Asians, you're seeing shifts among uh, Jewish voters. All these different ethnic groups across the city are beginning to shift right now. It's gonna be a slow, gradual right. uh, move to the right. right, but I would say the strategy to really take advantage of that is not to pander, is not to do the typical you know, rhino strategy of pandering. It's to, be, <laughs> it's to right. provide a, a real vision, to provide a real counter narrative to the left, because the left is good at framing the world, their utopia, their Green New Deal, all that. And then what do you have on the right? You have Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy. What do they stand for? I have no idea. I have no idea what Mitch McConnell's vision of the future of this country is. I know what Trump's were it was, you know, keep yeah. America great, make yeah. America great. You know, maybe you didn't like all the details about Trump and his and his and his background, but he had a vision and he and he fought for it. So Republicans have to do the same thing at the state level here in New York. It can't simply just be, you know, Democrat light. It can't just be, you know, just a few few degrees to the right from the Democrats. It has to be a holistic vision. What are you going to do about crime? What are you going to do about education? What are you going to do about the cost of living? What are you going to do about trash, homelessness? All these issues that are piling up in a place like New York City provide a counter narrative. Go on the offense, fight back, punch back, and don't talk and act like a regular Republican because that's not going to work. And no one's going to vote for that country club right. style Republicanism anymore. They want a sort of working class populist energy. And that's going to work great in a place like New York. And that's why we've seen the trends shift to the right. Yeah. It's always been interesting to me that the Republicans don't have an easier time with ethnic minorities, particularly first generation immigrants, because so many folks coming from other countries, particularly Hispanic countries, are very socially conservative and they would be against things like abortion and they'd be pro-family and probably people of faith, you know, broadly defined. And yet Republicans, even with that in place, seem to do a terrible job of communicating what you just mentioned to folks like that. How is that 
Why does that happen, and, and how can Republicans do a better job of communicating what you just said they need to communicate? I think a lot of Republicans have just been feckless, and they, and they think that their ideas, their policies, their positions are somehow uh, antithetical to a lot of people. But there mm. is a silent majority in this country, both of all races, of yep. all backgrounds, yep. who generally agree with what you just outlined. And they're just looking for someone to say it uh, and have the balls to stand behind it. And, you know, a lot of times Republicans are so scared of being called racist or being called yep. names. And they fold and, and then they stick to the strategy of pandering. But no one respects pandering. Look, Trump did not necessarily run uh, a very good uh, campaign based on targeting Hispanics. It really wasn't part of the agenda. He put more effort into targeting mm. uh, African Americans with the uh, platinum plan and all these other things. Right. But he still won. Uh, I think one of the highest percentages of Hispanic Americans, it was one of the biggest shifts. And that was basically a byproduct, almost an indirect consequence of just sticking to his message and counter signaling uh, against the left. The left is pushing, you know, they're going further and further left. And if you don't follow with them, but you move to the right or you stand your ground ideologically, you build that they will come and they'll start to flock to you. But I think a lot of Republicans uh, are, are beginning to realize that there's a realignment in this country and we're moving away uh, from the establishment or Orthodoxy that's governed the Republican Party for the last 20, 30, 40 years, this neoconservatism, and yep. we're moving slowly but surely into a sort of broader form of populism, American patriotism, you know, social conservatism, traditional cultural values, that kind of thing. It's sort of this amalgamation of different issues, and we're pushing it, and it's we're seeing success on the ground. And I think we just have to stick with it, and I think we will continue to bring Hispanics over. And the Democrats yep. realize that. That's why the Democrats are just trying to keep the borders open as much as possible. Because right. the longer people right. are in this country, the more assimilated they become, uh, and uh, they begin to shift to the right, except if they go through the college system, which is another problem, like I mentioned earlier. <laughs> right. Uh, man, so many interesting things there. Uh, the uh, immigration issue, there, there's just so many different ways to look at it, and, and hopefully Republicans are making gains. Um, one of my fears with the Republican Party is just that they're not very good at communicating what they believe. As you mentioned, you've said this. Um, it, it's hard to know. You, you can figure out what individual Republicans stand for, but it's very difficult to understand what the party means. You wrote an article recently, and um, I found it fascinating because I, I've, I've tried to make this point. Um, the article on your website, Republicans must become a pro-life party after row. And I think this is a great example of, of what you're talking about. Um, re New York has been, you know, very openly and even offensively pro-abortion, um, partial birth abortion. You know all of this. A lot of folks know this. Um, after Roe, the Republican Party has remained largely silent, and it's been crazy. Can you talk about that? Talk about why the Republican Party generally has responded the way they have, but then what you mean by they must become pro-family. I, I think this is a great example of so many of these other issues we're talking about. Yeah, no, thank you for reminding me. This is a very good point. I think uh, one issue, one bucket is that Republicans are constantly against something, that they're not for something. So right, you know, right. It, there's one thing to be against abortion, but then you should take it a step further. You should be pro-family. You should be pro-motherhood. That's how you should not only frame it from a from a rhetorical standpoint, but that's actually how you should be advancing policies, that you should right. be coming out and proactively suggesting policies that are gonna support families and family formation. And this is not just good ideologically that, oh, and on principle, this is also good electorally. If you right. look at any map and you look at the studies and you look at the data, it says that married couples with children are one of the best voting blocks of the Republican Party, along with wow. small business owners, et cetera. So we know the constituents that support our party, that support our movement, those are the constituents those are the groups that we should be actively trying to support and make sure that we have policies that don't actively hurt them, but that actively support them. And the left yeah. does this all the time. The left sees what are the groups that support them? Oh, it's going to be college educated, single women, uh, immigrants, etc. So they're going to encourage uh, policies that are going to promote the growth of those populations. They want people to stay single. They don't want people to have families. They certainly don't want people to own businesses and they want to bring as many people over here as possible because they understand that those are groups that are going to vote for them. The Democrats on our side, we, we look at groups that support us and we actively promote uh, policies and an agenda that hurts them. It was the same thing that Trump called out. You know, we have all this globalism, this free trade, uh, this economic global neoliberalism that has gutted the Midwest. It's gutted all the industrial manufacturing towns in this country. And there's a, there's a large silent majority in the heartland that has been negatively impacted yep. 
because of this this out of control free trade globalist agenda and no one was speaking to them republicans weren't speaking to them and democrats weren't speaking to them he took up the mantle and he said no we need to we need to raise the tariffs we're going to bring jobs back home we're going to bring the industrial base back to the heartland we're going to get you guys employed we're going to get the opioids and the drugs out of your communities and we're going to bring a sense of uh, revitalization to the american uh, the american industrial heartland the rust belt and that was a proactive policy it wasn't just being against something so i think that's part of it and i think as far as the specific the specific the specific point that you brought up about being pro family uh, this is this is a civilizational issue this is an issue that's impacting yeah. The broader Western world, we've seen birth rates collapse. We've seen people uh, not being able to have families out of financial and economic reasons, or choosing not to have families because of cultural reasons. This is not sustainable. This is a very, this is a sign of an unhealthy society. This is a society that's trending downward. I mean, even Elon Musk talks about, it, and he's not right. exactly conservative, right. <laughs> but he goes online and he says that the collapsing birth rate in the West is an issue. There's no economic system that can maintain. Uh, any kind of level of prosperity or growth when the population is collapsing. You mm. can't sustain a welfare state if the if the demographic pyramid is inversed and you have right. a small number of young people supporting an aging population. That's what's happening in Japan. So this is a massive issue and you combine it with with open open immigration and you're and like they have in Europe and that like we have in the United States and you're setting the stage uh, for a lot of uh, internal strife where you're you're basically importing new labor to compete with labor that already exists here mm. and you're pushing down the cost of labor. You're driving people who are already struggling with inflation now they have to deal with uh, lower purchasing power lower uh, lower salaries and a higher cost of living it's a really bad recipe all around and republicans need to be proactive they need to message on this they need to have policies that are not just anti something the democrats are doing but they're actively providing an alternative solution and when i put out uh, a list of policies that republicans can support from child care uh, tax credits to, to baby bonuses to a whole litany of things i was attacked as a socialist and this and that and the other but a lot of <laughs> A lot of liberals to moderates who aren't necessarily anti-abortion, they came and they said, you know, honestly, this is this is sensible. I support this. This is something I could get behind. So it's a policy that electorally would win people over, and it's a policy that's necessary. Why aren't more Republicans talking about it, though? I mean, this seems to be such a natural transition for Republicans, and yet they've been completely silent. Not completely. Some have have you know, stood up very few, though. As a party, though, they haven't. Why are they not jumping up and down about this? Abortion is not about this thing you're saying it's about. It's about the family. It's about our culture. It's about society. Why aren't they talking about that? It's a good point. I mean, I think at the end of the day, they've been stuck to these sort of tired old dogmas, you know, their concepts of what the Republican Party should be, that it should be, you know, on the altar of so-called free markets. But in many cases, it's not even free markets. It's really just corporatism and pro big business. But they've been they, they think that any proactive policy that the government can take to better the lives of Americans or to advance our agenda uh, is is now big government. It's a really convoluted thing, and it, it comes up in a lot of different ways. It comes up on the big tech issue. You know, yeah. anytime you bring up ways to, to, to rein in big tech, to rein in the monopolies, to rein in their abuses of, of power, uh, that, that you have these Republicans who immediately jump to their defense. They say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, we can't do this, we can't govern, we can't act, we cannot use power effectively because that would go against our you know, yeah. supposed beliefs. But you, you look at someone like Ron DeSantis, and he's not afraid to use power when necessary necessary to advance right. an agenda and, and effectuate on his political mandate. So I think we have to get over this, this really controlled token opposition mentality that we have that uh, Republicans, when they're in power, they can't do anything and they just have to be steamrolled. They just have to let the left do whatever they want because the second the left's in power, they use their power, yes. they use it effectively, they move the Overton window, they shift things in their direction and they enact policies that are very hard to revoke. Uh, so when we're in power, we need to be able to do the same. We need to, that's the only way you're gonna, have a, you're gonna have an actual fight because the Democrats are coming into this like it's a gunfight and we're coming into it like it's a fist fight. And it's, it's it's, it's, not a, it's not a balance that's sustainable. It's a, it's a losing mentality. And that didn't really change until Trump came around and he was saying, you know, why do we always have to constantly lose? Why right. do we have to surrender to the Dems? Why do we have to allow them to set the narrative, to set the agenda? But, you know, w with the pro-family policy, it, it, it's like you, you're totally fine with spend. They, they talk about, you know, small government, all this stuff. They're fine with sending money overseas. They're fine with sending hundreds of billions of dollars to all these different countries, Ukraine, wherever. But you talk about, hey, how about a policy that would, you know, give give working families uh, a little bit mm -hmm. of a tax break. How about a policy that would, you know, maybe cover the cost of childbirth for some of 
these families. Uh, oh, we can't do that. But then you look at it and the numbers, you know, I did, I did an analysis. The numbers would be a fraction of what we spend on a, on yeah. a litany of other things. Yeah. I mean, you could, get rid of, you could get rid of sugar subsidies, for instance, and you can, <laughs> fund, you can fund a baby bonus program where you get maybe $1,000 uh, on the birth of a child and it helps you with some costs of, you know, buying uh, whatever you need to buy at the, as soon as you have a child. But they don't want to think like that. Everything like they, they only bring up the argument about small government and free markets when it's a policy that does not benefit uh, the military industrial complex or woke corporations, because yeah. apparently that's all the Republican Party is, that they're that whatever the Chamber of Commerce tells them to do. They just say, how high? How high do I have to jump? Are there some people who are running right now, either for um, House of Representatives or for Senate that you're encouraged by that would begin to shift the Republican Party back to a conservative position? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's several state and local level. Someone like Joe Kent, I think, is going to yeah. be a breath of fresh he's air. Top of my list. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he gets it. Uh, you know, he's he's an American patriot. He understands what we're up against. He understands the time we're living in, and he's willing yeah. to rise to the occasion. He's willing to propose policies that maybe they're not the policies that we advocated in 1984, but they're right. policies that we need today in, in 20. Right. 22. Um, so he comes to mind. Uh, we've had some we've had some unfortunate losses across the country with some of our primaries, but I think even like a JD Vance or a Blake Masters, I think they understand. I think they're going to be uh, great additions to the Senate, which is even worse than the House, believe it or mm -hmm. not, in terms of the Rhino problem. So I think it's slowly but surely we're shifting things in the right direction. But I think the problem has just been is that a lot of Republicans have continued to cling to this very uh, just kind of dogmatic and outdated mode of thinking that yeah. that any that, that using the, the the government that you've been elected to in any way to advance any agenda is somehow bad. It, it, it makes no sense. And obviously, I, I obviously support lower taxes. I want to shrink the size of government overall. But at the same time, you could be pragmatic here and you could realize that there are serious issues facing our country and we should have a pragmatic approach and it should not necessarily be Anything that we do is, is it's too much government, too big government, whatever, whatever their excuse may be, or supposedly not free market enough. I mean, it comes back even to the trade issue or the yep. open borders issue. I mean, a lot yep. of them say, oh, open borders, you know, we'll, we'll just let us, we'll, we'll treat millions of people coming over here as if we treat them like a economic commodity rather than, you know, living people with cultures, with history, with, 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 with their own identity. And they'll also treat the same thing with free trade. Oh, free trade's fine. But it's like, is it fine? What have the results been? We've gutted our economy because yeah. no one else is playing by the free yeah. trade agenda. Yeah. China isn't. Europe isn't. We're the suckers that do that. So we suffer the consequences because we're, we're clinging to this you know, dogmatic view of the world rather than a pragmatic, realistic view of what's happening and where. No, that's good. Um, I mean, there's a lot there. When you look at President Trump, um, I think a lot of us... Uh, are very thankful that he was the president for the amount of time that he was. Um, I would be certainly in favor of another uh, Trump presidency, uh, although I would be very in favor of a DeSantis presidency as well. Um, the Democrats are trying to kneecap him to prevent him from being able to run. Um, will they be successful? And how do you see that unfolding in the next, uh, I mean, 24 is not that far off as we come to the presidential election in a couple of years. Uh, I don't think they're going to be successful. I think they're going to throw as much as they can at him just to shape the narrative and, and to muddy the waters. But yeah. I don't think they're actually going to be able to prevent him from running. I don't think they're going to be, be able to prevent him from winning. And I think the fact that they're going to all these lengths uh, to come after him show a level of desperation because they know that he is a political force to be reckoned with, that he can bring out uh, voters that, that otherwise yeah. would not come out and vote for Republicans. Um, and I think they know that he is on a, uh, a vendetta. He's on a mission uh, to go after the deep state. He was already in Washington. He understands now. He learned from what happened. Uh, and he can go in there and immediately begin to effectuate change, to change policy, to get rid of the people that need to be getting rid of. Um, I think DeSantis would be a fantastic president as well. But I think DeSantis, you know, he could be our he could be our nominee in 2028. Sure. Uh, I so and look, if, if if Trump chooses not to run, then I'll probably support DeSantis. But I think he is going to run. And I think DeSantis has another four years where he can continue to strengthen Florida and do a lot of great work in yeah. Florida. And I think uh, that's only going to set the stage for him to be even an even stronger candidate uh, come 2028. But uh, I think it's it's Trump's to win. It's it's Trump's to lose, rather. Um, and I think he'd be the most effective force. And look, I mean, a lot of people are talking about, oh, we lost this special election. Oh, we haven't done as good in these races. And I think the biggest problem is, is that without Trump at the top of the ticket and without Trump actively running, hmm. the Republicans 
they falter because who, the, the leadership of the Republican Party doesn't have a clue right. about what the base cares about, what the base wants, or how to win over voters. You know, it, it's Trump that gets the energy. It's Trump that gets the crowd. It's Trump that brings them out. And when Trump isn't on the ballot, you see Republicans lose special elections in places like Alaska or Minnesota or wherever it may be. Uh, so I think you know Trump should announce sooner rather than later, and I think he should be campaigning uh, to retake the majorities in both houses because clearly Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy yeah, are not yeah. up to the task. Uh, is there any concern in your mind or your heart <laughs> that uh, President Trump is bringing too much baggage into a race, that he will have those who will be devoted to him, but that anyone who's not... Um, already in that camp is just going to say, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. That the, that the Democrats have done such a good job of damaging his brand that people will stay away from that. Or is that not something that should be concerned about? I mean, I hate to quote the polls, but even the polls aren't showing that. I think in a head-to-head -head versus Biden, he's still going to wipe the floor. Uh, I think at the end of the day, whatever baggage he may has, the, he may have the one thing he does have is a spine, and I think that's what they're scared about. And the, the, they would not be coming after him as hard as they are mm. uh, if they did not think he was a threat. And uh, I think DeSantis is great, but they're not coming after DeSantis as right. hard. Right. They don't view him nearly as much as a, as right. a threat, uh, whether they think he's either electorally feasible or would be a threat if he were to be in office. But they are coming after Trump, both because they think he could be a threat in office and electorally they, they see him as a threat. Uh, so I think that tells you a lot. And uh, I think a lot of people have made their minds up about Trump now, but I also think a lot of people regret uh, maybe voting for yeah, Biden right, and right. voting for Trump. So I think there's a lot of winnable people in the middle that with all the stuff that's happening in this country, whether it's you know inflation, the, the crime wave, the open borders, the state of the economy, you name it, there's a litany of issues. I think those guys are going to come back home if they were you know maybe first time Trump voters and they went for Biden. I think a lot of them are going to come back home uh, and vote for Trump in a big way. Have enough election reform steps taken place that Trump could be elected fairly? Yeah, and I think this is a good question because a lot of people are going to get nihilistic, and I think half the strategy uh, from the Dems is to make people think that elections right. can't be won anymore. Right. And if you if you already think that you can't win and you're nihilistic, you're not going to go out and vote. So Correct. you've already won the battle. So I think what what happened in 2020 was a one and done type of thing, and I think uh, people are now all the wiser to it. I think the reforms that have been done since then have only strengthened our system and the integrity of the systems. And I think a lot of the changes that happened in the midst of the COVID pandemic were done uh, again in the midst of a pandemic and right. were not actually right. happen in a normal environment through the legislative process or other, other legal non-emergency channels. So I think all those things combined are only going to support uh, his, his chances to fight off whatever uh, you know ch chicanery may go yeah, on. Right. I think we're going to see a lot of new Republican governors. I think we're going to see uh, a, a new Republican you know, majority in both chambers. And I think that's also going to impact at the, at the state and local level, which altogether uh, will fortify uh, the elections, to use uh, the yeah. term of the, uh, the left. MyPillow is having their biggest sheet sale of the year. You all have helped build MyPillow into the amazing company that it is today. Now, Mike Lindell, inventor and CEO, wants to give back exclusively to his listeners. The Percale and Giza Dream bed sheet sets are available in a variety of colors and sizes, and they are all on sale for as low as $29.98 with our listener promo code. Order now, because when they're gone, they're gone. The Percale and Giza Dream sheets are breathable and have a cool, crisp feel. They come with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. There's a limited supply, so be sure to order now. Call 1-800-870-0283. Use the promo code SITREP or go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener square and use promo code SITREP. You're making me feel a lot better about things. I feel like I'm sitting in a counseling session right now. So you're really helping me. I appreciate it. Here's my last uh, piece of anxiety that I deal with in my head is that the Republicans are going to retake the House. Hopefully they'll retake the Senate here in a few months. And then because Republicans are terrible at, you know, their jobs, um, we're going to come into 24 and it's going to be an uphill fight because they're going to punt it. Um, will the Republicans, if they take the House and the Senate, the House for sure, hopefully the Senate, will they do the right things, the things that need to be done to take the, the White House? I won't. I wouldn't hold my breath. I think the establishment is going to continue to do establishment nonsense and continue to shoot themselves in the foot and uh, not help us advance our agenda. Yeah. 
about that at all. Uh, I don't think it's going to hurt us in 2024 because I think Trump at the top of the ticket. Right, right. It's going to be such a wave that will overcome that. But it's it's a long-term problem. It's not necessarily a short-term problem. It's a long-term problem. And I think Trump needs to realize he was very forgiving and he gave yeah. a lot of people second yeah. chances. And he brought a lot of people in who never really liked him and still didn't like him. Maybe they put on a face, but he needs to understand that yeah. uh, if he's going to be able to effectively govern and govern on his agenda, he needs to clean house. He needs to get rid of people who are not ideologically aligned or committed with him. And he needs to replace them with people that are true loyalists, not the kind of loyalists that are going to be syncophants, but the kind of loyalists that are going to tell him when yeah. he's wrong, when he's yeah. going in the wrong direction and how to stay on track and how to stay uh, on focus with his with his America, America first agenda. Uh, those are the kind of people you want to surround yourself with rather than the syncophants who will smile to your face but right. stab you in the back when when the right. chips are down and that's was kind of the problem with this first term it was a staffing issue and that's what made that's what made the loss in 2020 even worse because things were slowly getting really good the staffing was getting better the agenda was starting to really come together uh, a lot of the hiccups that happened early yeah. on is you know new to governing new to dc new to the system to the bureaucracy all that was being fleshed out and softened out, and it was going to make the second term even more impressive than the first. And the first was probably one of the most impressive terms a president right. has ever had in right. modern American history in terms of the stuff he got done. And that was done against the odds. That was yep. done against yep. a party run by Paul Ryan, who was actively mm. sabotaging him at every move. So I think going forward, I think there's a lot to be hopeful for, but we still have to be vigilant and we still have to make sure that we're doing the long uh, we're playing the long game here in turn of cleaning out the party, yeah. making sure we get more uh, MAGA, America First candidates elected, and of course, continuing to fight back on our second front against the left, or our main yeah. front, rather. Man, that's good. Uh, Gavin, I appreciate your clear thinking on these things and uh, your ability to articulate. It's fantastic. Where can people follow you? Uh, your, your website's wonderful. It's laid out very clearly. Your writing's great. But where can people follow you and, and learn more about the work that you're involved in? Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the kind words. You can follow me uh, on Twitter at Gavin Wax. That's the same on Instagram, Facebook, uh, everything MySpace. I don't know if I have a MySpace, but you can follow me on there as well. <laughs> and of course, uh, the website, GavinWax.com, all my articles, whether they're in Town Hall, American Greatness, Newsmax, and all the rest. And uh, thank you again for having me. Awesome. Gavin Wax, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. We've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org. Grateful for Gavin's perspective. Uh, he understands the issues, which is fantastic, and he's extremely gifted uh, at articulating those issues, and uh, thankful for that. A lot of people who understand can't explain, and he can do both. And uh, grateful for him. Please go and check him out. His, uh, his website, his blog is uh, fantastic, uh, very clear, easy to understand, broken down well. Uh, you'll do yourself a service by checking that out and following him. Thank you for watching and or listening to the show. If you're listening and have not yet subscribed, you need to do that. Do that right now. That would be awesome. Subscribe. If on the platform that you are listening from, there's a place to Leave a comment, leave a rating, please do that. That helps the show, of course. And then take some time, go over to YouTube, find our channel on YouTube, search for The Situation Report, you'll find us there. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, and also there, you can leave us a comment, share the content out, and uh, by being subscribed and having hit that notification bell, you will receive notifications as soon as new content comes out and want to make sure you are tracking on all of that. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next time.